Ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the European Parliament, dear friends, on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, I would like to welcome you to the online presentation and debate on 100% renewables for a crisis-proof European Green Deal. My name is Eva van der Acht and I am head of the Brussels office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We are hosting this event in troublesome times. There are no simple solutions for the major challenges ahead of us in recent months. It has been pointed out several times that the management of a crisis provides opportunities for the future. However, the way the EU has dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic in the very beginning has shown that its cohesion is extremely vulnerable. We are convinced that the European Green Deal needs to be the EU's answer to the question of how to find sustainable and solidary ways out of the multiple crises we are facing. Transforming our economies to a system based on 100% renewables is key to achieve climate neutrality before 2050. The benefits are manifold for our environments, our industries and our local communities. Leaving fossil fuels and nuclear energy behind is not only key to tackle the climate crisis and to avoid increasing quantities of highly radioactive waste, it's also an economic imperative. The Heinrich Böll Foundation has been actively promoting European cooperation to advance a European sustainable energy transition for several years now, and we continue to support European efforts that are so much needed for enhancing political ambition, flexibility and technology options. We are therefore very pleased that the German Institute for Economic Research will present its brand new research study entitled Make the European Green Deal Real, Combining Climate Neutrality and Economic Recovery Today. And I would like to thank the team behind the study for the excellent cooperation. I would also like to thank our distinguished guests and speakers for their contributions and my colleague Martin Keim, head of our European Energy Transition Programme, who will moderate the debate. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva, and a uh, very warm welcome also from my side. I have the honor and, and pleasure also to moderate this, this um, excellent event today. And uh, I won't talk uh, a lot uh, at this stage, so I'll just briefly introduce our first panelists who are also presenting their brand new study today. And uh, the panelists come from the German Institute for Economic Research, which is also known as the DEV Berlin in German. Um, I'll start off with, with Professor Claudia Kempfert, who is very well known in, in Germany as, um, as um, economic and, and, and environment uh, research professor. She's uh, currently head of the Department of Energy, Transportation and Environment at the DUV Berlin. She's professor of energy and sustainability at the Heritage School of Governance as well. And other than that, she has, she's a member of the German Council of the Environment, um, which is also known as the Sachverständigenrat the, uh, um, for uh, Umweltfragen in, in German. She, 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 her research focuses on economic assessment of climate and energy policy. And um, she's also part of the high level group on energy and climate, um, in, uh, and energy and climate where she actually also advised uh, former commission president, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. Um, so she's um, an expert in, in many different panels um, where she's also, for instance, advising the, the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, also known as the IPCC. Um, further on, we have the honor to have uh, Professor uh, Christian von Hirschhausen, who is also a professor of economics and part of the economics uh, work group for infrastructure and economics at the Berlin Institute, which is the, uh, at, the, at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, he is he has a PhD in industrial economics from the Ecole Nationale Supérieure de Mines in, in Paris, and he was previously chair of the energy economics um, chair in the TU Dresden. Uh, as the same as, as Claudia, um, Mr. Hirschhausen, Professor Hirschhausen has been working in the renewable energy sector for over 20 years now, 
and um, also been an advisor to numerous uh, different bodies amongst the World Bank, the European Commission, the European Investment Banks, and several ministries. And last but not least, of course, we have Dr. Paul Yu Oi, which, uh, who is also part of the, the Technical University, sorry, the Technical University in Berlin, and who is heading a 20-member research group um, on the exit of coal so, and um, the corresponding coal transition research, research hub, examining the transition from fossil fuels towards renewable energy sources. He's been involved in numerous research projects on the German and global coal phase out, and he's a um, um, industrial engineer with a PhD in economics from the TU Berlin. So uh, just a few technical remarks before the three of them, who we are really glad to have on board today, are going to kick off with their study. Um, do you have a Q&A in the bar you see below? And um, I really asked you to, um, to use this question and answers um, function for, for a lively debate. We'll have a first question of answers question and answer session after the presentation of the DV Berlin, uh, where you can address your questions directly to uh, the speakers. And then we'll have another session of, uh, of inputs that I will introduce, the people I'll introduce after that. And then we'll kick up with a debate with all of you together. So uh, I have the pleasure now to give the floor to Professor Claudia Kempfen. Thank you. Eva, and thank you, Martin. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning on behalf of the DIW. I wish everybody a good morning. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to present today um, the study we have uh, done. Thank you, Christian, for showing uh, the slide. Um, as we already heard, uh, the name of the study is Make uh, the European Green Deal Real. And that means uh, combining climate neutrality and the economic uh, recovery. And um, Christian will um, show the, the slides and um, I will hand over then later on uh, to Christian. Yes, um, thanks a lot that we can uh, show uh, the, um, the study and present the study this morning. Um, it's, um, it's a joint study with uh, many colleagues you see here. Uh, 10 further colleagues, I will not um, name them all. Now I want to click, but I say is that the European Green Deal is, um, is a great issue and we, we looked at that because in times of the Corona crisis, we have to solve several crises. One is the economic recovery in uh, Corona times. So the second one is also uh, the Green Deal to reduce emissions, to have a zero pollution Europe by 2050 latest. And that's why uh, we, we looked uh, in this uh, recent study um, and how, what, what kind of impact this has on the economy and also on the energy system and the energy transformation which we need in order to reach that. And, and you see here in this slide, it's not only that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we also um, have several goals, which is the transition to a circular economy um, and also uh, sustainable uh, agriculture, uh, sustainable transportation, achieve climate neutrality, have clean, reliable and affordable energy and financing the transition as well. So we need some kind of just transition mechanism in order to reach that. And the, and the goal is here, not only carbon neutrality, but leave no one behind. And that's one issue which is really important if we look also at the economic uh, consequences uh, related to this. So what we do here in the study, and Christian and Paul Yu will uh, talk about this later on as well, uh, we look at the energy system and the energy system transformation in order um, uh, to reach exactly the emission reduction goals. And uh, Christian, if you could put uh, the, next, uh, the next slide, please, is um, that um, um, uh, I don't want to push, push a button because then the camera and the micro is off again. Um, so uh, it's probably not working, Christian. Uh, could you try to, to move to the next slide? I think... Um, Christian has the same difficulties probably as I had before. 
is he frozen actually i'm sorry so it's it's kind of technical um challenging uh, this morning I'm, I'm sorry for this usually we do uh, we do that in a in a more smooth way and um so what what is the ambition level we found out that we what that we need to have a more ambition level ambitious level which is 60 to 65 percent emission reduction by 2030 if we want to reach a 1.5 emission reduction goal and um we would also have a solidarity in Europe um, in order to, to reach that goal, especially in, in Germany, we have to do a full transformation towards the 100% renewable energy and um, in other countries as well. And to help all European countries in order to reach that is exactly what the European Green Deal wants to do. What we did in the study is though, um, we looked at the impact of the energy system transformation and that's um, that uh, on the one hand, the share of renewables are increasing, uh, uh, the, the share is increasing and thanks now uh, we are back. <laughs> thanks Christian. So um, this is a kind of a challenging uh, technology this morning. Um, so we had some different kind of models which we used here for the energy system modeling. It's called uh, Genesis Mod, uh, which will Christian and Paul Yu later on also um, report on, that we include the assumptions or the goals that the European Green Deal is, um, is having and also um, pushing towards a, a full transformation. And we do it in a, in a joint modeling work uh, with Genesis uh, Mod, uh, pathways uh, for, for the electricity, for the heating and transportation uh, system. And two things are important here. The one is uh, that the uh, electricity demand is increasing. It's actually doubling by 2050. And the other one is that the primary, prim primary energy demand is substantially uh, declining. And this is because um, oil is substituted also by primarily electricity. Um, Okay, yeah, okay, fine, <laughs> fine with that. Um, so it's primarily uh, replaced by electricity. So the, you see here already uh, that the primary energy demand is declining, especially in the transportation sector. Um, we will have more railway transport, more electricity and transportation. That means the, uh, the electricity demand is doubling, but the primarily primary energy demand is, um, is declining substantially. And these both issues are really important if we, look at the, if we look at the impacts. What we also find is that we have almost no investment in nuclear power after 2020. That's basically because of costs. And um, what we also see uh, is the micro effect that um, uh, with the, with the uh, climate neutrality, uh, we, we will have more ambitious targets and the emission reduction uh, is, is ongoing um, exactly uh, as we see here that we have a substantial decline in emissions, uh, 15 gigaton by 2030 and uh, 60 gigaton by 2050. And um, we have two macroeconomic effects. One is that the investments into new technology creates jobs and uh, uh, further um, economic benefits, especially of avoided damages. Uh, if you see here, um, the avoided damages are coming from nuclear and fossil fuel and um, the sustainable investment in efficiency and in equipment, insulation, transportation creates a new economic um, uh, beneficial effects uh, as uh, value added and also new jobs uh, in several sectors. Uh, so we see over uh, 3000 billion uh, euro investment into renewables, but uh, uh, at the same time, we uh, reduce the fossil fuel uh, costs, especially because we, we, do, we do not have to import this high amount of fossil fuel imports, which is uh, roughly 2000 billion euro, uh, euro, which is avoided. So at the end, you see much lower energy system costs, uh, especially because uh, the costs of uh, the uh, fossil fuel and nuclear based systems are extremely high and uh, the investments into renewables and the, uh, the system costs are much lower um, if we are basing especially on uh, renewable energy. 
So I think that's, um, that's uh, the part from, from my side. Uh, so we have a conclusion of the do's and the don'ts. And the do's is especially to increase the greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction targets because uh, with a less ambitious uh, target, uh, we will not meet the 1.5 uh, Celsius uh, um, target of, uh, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have to address the decarbonization of the transport and heating sector. The sector coupling is especially important. And uh, what is also important, the third do's, uh, do is to continue the recovery progress with the uh, sustainable uh, investment. What we don't have to do, and uh, this is especially the European address, which we say that there's no bridge function of any kind of fossil fuels like LNG terminals or something else, or um, uh, gray hydrogen or blue, um, blue hydrogen, uh, which is the fantasy of some um, politicians in order to have um, fossil fuels uh, in the system, that is uh, especially uh, natural gas or coal, and no subsidies, um, so avoid subsidies uh, um, to maintain the fossil fuels uh, or other um, energy or uh, environmental harmful subsidies, and um, especially don't go into natural gas power plants because some call it as a bridge technologies. We find this hinders the transformation towards a full uh, supply and the full transformation towards a 100% renewable energy world. Um, so uh, this, is, this is exactly what we have to do, go into the do's, um, avoid uh, the, the, the barriers for the renewable energy and invest into it, in the, into the system transformation. Okay, and that's from my side. Now I hope it works better. I see uh, Paul Yu has uh, taken over the slides. Christian, please take over. I hope this works now, thanks. It's it's to Christian, right? All right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, Sorry for this. Thank you. I'm secure, and I hope um, you 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 can hear me. Um, so so let me thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you also, Ifa and Martin, and everybody for hosting this uh, interesting webinar. Let, let me continue with the energy economic implications of our study and they have already been mentioned um, de decarbonizing the energy system and uh, zero carbon means zero carbon right so that's exit of coal that means exit of fossil natural gas and it means exit of fossil oil because otherwise you cannot decarbonize. And that's also what is analyzed in the second part of the study. Um, the coal exit is well underway, but needs to be accelerated. You see here a couple of countries that have decided coal exit dates, but there are also some like Germany where this has to be accelerated. And you see uh, East Europe and Southeastern Europe where dates have not been set and uh, Paul Yu is going to uh, focus on that because that has to do with the just transition and the solidarity. But uh, coal exit is not enough. We also need uh, <clears throat> to exit fossil natural gas. Natural gas, as a matter of fact, is much more dangerous to climate than is generally assumed. Um, <clears throat> in a 20-year perspective that we need to adopt because we have 20, 30 years to 2050, it has a global warming potential of between 86 and 105, so it's much stronger than um, CO2. Currently, most analyses are done with a value of 25 imported natural gas because it has transportation costs, because it has methane leakage, is even dirtier than coal. That's something that's not generally known, but um, <clears throat> that's a fact. And so fossil gas exits under our Paris uh, scenario in the 2040s. The same thing also happens to um, oil. Oil uh, disappears uh, from the passenger transportation sector because it's, it's replaced by um, electric uh, traction. Uh, railways have a more important role. You see this, this, this red, this, this green, 
bar here is the share of railways, electrified, of course, 100% renewables railways from the 2040s on. And you see also something important that the energy demand from the transport sector decreases because we're in a scenario where demand habits also change. Um, since Davide is here, I can also mention that in the industry sector, uh, oil and gas are also replaced by mainly electrified heat and a little bit of hydrogen. Okay, once uh, we have exited the, the fossil fuels, um, <clears throat> we need to talk about the big elephant in the room, which is nuclear power. Nuclear power is not mentioned very much in the European Green Deal because it's a kind of taboo at the European level. And even though <clears throat> uh, energy uh, is responsibility of the national uh, governments, uh, we need to talk about uh, nuclear power because it's expensive, it's not clean, and it has, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, it has long-term issues that are not being addressed. One is the decommissioning of power plants and the other is the long-term storage radioactive waste. So economically, it's very simple. Um, <clears throat> nobody would uh, invest into nuclear power for e economic reasons. So actually what's gonna happen is under this scenario is that by 2030, about half of the capacity are gone and um, no new plants are built, neither is um, lifetime extension a topic. So at the end of the period, we end up with countries having one perhaps uh, plan with Lamonville, probably Hinkley Point, Mohovce, but they are not economic as such. So in, in our overall scenario, they disappear from the picture, which leads us to the question of the 100% renewables. Um, <clears throat> next slide, uh, which different studies address differently. In our uh, calibration, wind takes a large share. Other calibrations like the ones by uh, uh, AUT University have a stronger role of solar that can be discussed in detail. What's important on the right-hand side is that you have uh, the de development of uh, flexibility mechanisms, uh, storage, lithium-ion storage, mainly a little bit of low battery, a little bit of hydrogen. As Claudia mentioned, um, this needs to be local hydrogen, uh, importing hydrogen from fossil fuel production in Australia or somewhere else does not make any sense for the decarbonization. And, and, and it includes a, a share for electrolysis and a little bit of methanation. Now, if we take a look at the question, do the lights stay on <clears throat> and is the heat assured? We can assure you, and this is uh, something we're quite proud of because this is a sector modeling coupling between the top-down model and the bottom-up model that is being used here. Yes, the lights stay on <clears throat> and it stays warm. Even in the winter, we have calculated here hour by hour scenarios for electricity and heat supply in France and Poland. France, <clears throat> Uh, with a fully renewable su uh, supply of mainly wind, but also a little bit of um, solar, of course, uh, an important share for trading. We need Europe, we need the internal market, we need trading, and Poland can supply itself without um, coal as well. We're in 2040, so that's 20 years hence. And um, <clears throat> So let me come to the conclusion of this second part here. Um, we need to favor in the recovery packages 100% uh, renewable supply in the, mean, in the medium term. Flexibility options are important, storage, networks, demand side management, and um, the European coordination needs to be improved in particular with the coordination of investment projects. There's no sense in replacing fossil coal by fossil natural gas. Um, it does not make sense. And, and here's a very important uh, development that needs to be followed that 
the EU subsidizes fossil natural gas infrastructure, for example, in the projects of common interest, the PCI list, which, ha which has been voted by the parliament recently. And of course, it doesn't make economic sense to subsidize new nuclear power or lifetime extensions. Thank you very much. And now we go on to the solidarity issue and the just transition presented by Pao Yu. Thanks. So thank you very much for my first two speakers. And I will continue with the last part on the aspect of solidarity required, which I think is even more important in times of COVID. And some people have mentioned already beforehand, um, there will be a lot of differences for different member states with respect to the initial conditions and the upcoming challenges. So it depends on the situation that the country is in at the moment. It depends on the situation that the country was in the past. So it has where it has gone through already and for the upcoming challenges. What you can see here on the left hand side is the electricity mix in 2020, more or less the way that we have it now, and the electricity mix in 2040 in our scenario that would meet the Paris climate target, showing 100% renewable energies. What you can see is especially that you have a lot of brownish and reddish colors which indicate fossil fuels or nuclear power plants, which are replaced by renewables in yellow, PV, or in these greenish colors would be more wind power plants. And what you can see, of course, is that the challenges, especially for countries such as Poland, will be bigger to replace coal. For France, for example, it will be more difficult to replace nuclear. And so these are things that have to be included in our thoughts. While some countries will manage the transition even earlier, some will need a bit more time. This has to be taken into account when coming up with plans. As I mentioned, we also have to think of the past. And um, there's a lot to learn also from the UK example, but I will focus here on Germany because I'm from Germany and that's why I know most about this. Um, but starting even in Europe, the European Union has a long history, starting with the European coal and steel community being the predecessor of the European Union. So basically the reason why we have the European Union, why we have peace and prosperity in Europe is because of the communion of coal and steel community. And this is of course very important also for Germany, especially for the Western part of Germany. And this is where the identity of a lot of regions still origins from. And the future for all these regions is renewables, but still we have to remember the past. And you can see in the past, there were more than 150 million tons of hard coal being produced in mines. There were more than 600,000 directly employees. If we're speaking of indirect jobs, we are exceeding 1 million. And we see the hard coal mining, which has basically ended in 2018 already. So long story short, from a positive angle, you can say a big part of the transition has happened already, but still there are some things which are, have to be dealt with. In Germany, this is not so much hard coal, but more lignite. In other countries, it's also still hard coal remaining. And one thing is that we have undergone a lot of changes already, and there's a lot of things that we can learn from. We should apply the lessons learned from past transitions. We should not repeat the mistakes of the past. I'm not saying that everything that has happened in the past was good. There were also some mistakes being made, but that's why it's even more important in the future to do better. Some major lessons learned that were identified not only in Germany, but also in UK and in many other examples. First, refrain from subsidizing the fossil of the fissile industry. If you want to phase out an industry, it doesn't make sense to subsidize it. If it's too difficult to penalize it, at least stop subsidizing it. We should subsidize new technologies such as renewables, maybe some other research projects, but we should stop existing subsidization of the fossil industry. Second, include long-term effects and international impacts in decision-making. We should not consider only the generations of today, but we should also consider future generations. We should consider young voters, which are not yet able to have been putting the votes for in the past, but which will come forward in the next elections. We see these in Fridays for Future demonstrations all across Europe and across the globe we see international impacts, not only in Europe, but also globally due to climate change. And this is why we have to take these impacts into consideration. If we have forums, roundtables of people deciding something, we should include these voices in the process. Third, listen to external independent advice in addition to incumbent regime. Of course, you also have to talk to the actors of the incumbent regime, meaning fossil fuel companies, meaning the people in the region, etc. But you also have to listen to independent advice because if you're only talking to coal companies, it will be very difficult to find a strategy that actually phases out coal or fossil fuels in general. Next, diversification can minimize the risk. There is no silver bullet. 
you will not find one technology. Some people believe in hydrogen being the new oil, being the new gas that can replace everything. This will not happen. It can be that for small locations, you will find a silver bullet for this location, but this bullet will not meet the criteria for the different locations. So therefore you have to diversify. You have to think of many different options. All of them have to be sustainable. Then you have to hope that these new options as a total can replace the fossil industry. Participation in general enables locally adapted solutions and increases the acceptance. In a democracy such as Europe, it is not possible to decide something top down. You have to incorporate the people. They have solutions as well, so you have to include them. That's why participation becomes even more important. And of course, encourage the cooperation across borders. It is not a problem of Germany, it's not a problem of Poland, it's a problem of Europe. And it's something that we can tackle together, but even coal areas sometimes are across borders. We've seen this in Germany and France in the past. We still see it in Germany, Czech Republic and Poland. Um, and this is why this has to be tackled in a uniform approach. And this approach will be very difficult because we have to transform from a fossil fuel based economy to a renewable energy system. And some of us always want to think only of the energy system because this is technical and we can solve this. But there's so many regional aspects that I cannot focus on enough. And this is workers and citizens, economy and industry, the infrastructure, not only being highways, but also being IT infrastructure, of course, education, research, soft location factors. And all of this has to be financed somehow. And the Just Transition Fund is one scheme to help funding this together with local national schemes as well. And all of this has to be done through a policy-centric governance and planning approach by the EU Commission as well. And we have to include all relevant stakeholders as much as possible within this process. So this is a very complex transition that we are heading forward, but with the Just Transition Fund, as well as the European Green Deal, we can manage this. And this is why I'm coming to my final conclusion, the do's and the do nots. First of all, the do's. We have to address the energy transformation in all member states. The slogan of the EU Green Deal, leave no one behind, has to be a central element. We cannot forget this. Second, because of this, we have to design the burden sharing agreement accordingly. We have to incorporate that for some countries such as Poland, it will be more difficult. However, funds for them also have to be conditional to the fact that we meet the Paris Agreement. So we cannot simply give funds to the fossil industry. The Just Transition Fund can be used to complement national and local initiatives. It cannot finance everything, so this is why we need national and local initiatives as well. But of course, we have to be aware that countries such as Germany have much more financial resources doing so, especially in times of COVID. And especially in times of COVID, it is even more important to do this in a sustainable way. It would be the wrong thing now not to do anything with respect to the climate crisis and then in five years time to realize that we have increased the incumbent regime's power. Do not, do not rely on European initiatives only, but also look nationally. Do not repeat the errors of structural change policies from the past. A lot of things can be learned from the past, so talk to the people that were engaged in this process and improve the things. The difficulty for the upcoming transition is we don't have 50 years. We have 10 years, maybe 20 years to change. So therefore we have to act now. We should not abuse the just transition mechanisms to continue the fossil fuel activities, like for example, also carbon capture, or some people try to invest also in nuclear, but we should go towards 100% renewables and we should go to that now. So I apologize for being maybe relatively fast, but we have to speed up to leave also some time for discussion with you. So therefore I'm closing here with the conclusion that we strongly believe that we can make the European Green Deal real by combining the climate neutrality and the economic recovery. You can find the study online, everything is linked, and you can also ask questions to us later on. And therefore, thank you very much in the name of the three speakers of us who are just speaking on behalf of 10 authors in total and numerous studies in numerous research projects. And therefore, I'm handing back to the um, managers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia, Christian, and Pao Yu. And also, thank you very much for, for being brief and succinct with this excellent um, findings. Um, I think we had a, a quite comprehensive overview um, on your study findings, which is, uh, I can remind this uh, now online. We'll now have a really quick uh, question and answer session that is going directly um, to, to the study authors. And I think um, there was one question in, uh, in the question and answer session, session that Christian uh, already highlighted that he wanted to, to answer directly. I'm gonna read out the questions for those who haven't seen it. 
and then uh, I'll give Christian a chance to answer. So the question was, about 20% of the primary energy demand is only needed as electrical power, the rest is needed as heat. How is this addressed by the European Green Deal? And how do the European Green Deal, the Just Transition Fund, and the ESF and the ERDF go together? So the ESF is the European Social Fund, and the ERDF is the European Regional Fund for, uh, the, for, European Fund for the Regional Development. So Christian, if you would like to address that one. Yeah. Um, so thank, thank you very much. Probably, Pao, pa you, uh, you can go to the first slide, the European Green Deal. Um, the overview. Actually, the Europe, as <coughs> Claudia mentioned, and, and this is well known to most of you, the European Green Deal is, is a bouquet of literally thousands of pages uh, work um, that uh, includes a zero pollution, which is linked to the issue of, of decarbonization which includes um, also the, the clean transportation, it's called sustainable transport, you see it here, and uh, electricity, heat, transportation, which is power, is addressed in different chapters, right? So you have a sustainable transportation, which uh, implies the, the, the end of internal combustion motors, um, the climate neutrality is an overarching uh, topic. The uh, energy mix is addressed in the clean, reliable and affordable, affordable energy. Financing the transition has the issue of, of the taxonomy that you should not give, for example, fossil natural gas the target of being clean or, or, or green. So, so it's, a, it's a whole bunch of, of sub chapters where this is addressed. This also relates to the question, and let me take the example of the Just Transition Fund here, because the 7.5 billion that are foreseen for the Just Transition for the regional support are supposed to go hand in hand with the ESF and the ERDF. And they're also supposed to, to leverage private investments, local activities, investments, foreign investments, etc. So, so these are used as a kind of leverage um, <clears throat> that are complementary and not substitutes for, for local activity. Um, let, let me probably just repeat the questions on the so-called green hydrogen from, from Northern Africa, which is, I think Claudia mentioned it, there is no green hydrogen. There's hydrogen that is produced locally, probably for, by an excess of wind electricity. But if you look out of your windows, you see uh, gases are don't have any color. Don't let yourself fool by uh, hydrogen that is imported somewhere without asking what is the origin, what is the transformation, are fossil fuels um, implied there, some, sometimes called blue hydrogen, doesn't make any sense. This is hydrogen produced with coal power or with, with uh, natural gas. And uh, so that's why we're very skeptical about uh, large scale imports. We in the scenario taken actually from the open entrance uh, project exclude hydrogen imports. We consider it not economic and not sustainable if it's based on fossil fuels. So hydrogen, if it's used, should be produced uh, locally. Thanks. May I add uh, one, uh, only one sentence, especially if we talk about heat, is um, we have to distinguish uh, between the uh, heat and the building sector where we need to have a strong energy efficiency um, effort in order to reduce the energy demand in buildings and uh, the, the heat um, that you are producing should be also uh, renewable. That means it could be a heat pump with uh, eco-electricity uh, or something else. And in heat uh, of the industry, of course, um, we have to look carefully of what kind of heat we are talking about. And um, uh, as Christian already mentioning, mentioned it, and for you as well, if we are talking about hydrogen, it should be strongly green hydrogen. And as we should uh, reach a goal of, of energy saving and energy efficiency improvement, that's the first goal. And the second is to have renewables 
everywhere as possible and uh, hydrogen should be green and not uh, gray or, or blue. Thank you very much, uh, Christian and Claudia and Claudia also for the clarifications on hydrogen. I think there's a huge debate right now, especially in Germany with the um, new hydrogen strategy and so it's important to address these topics. Since we are a little bit behind our time schedule, uh, let me allow the other participants that we plan to convene today um, to give us to, to give them uh, um, their perspectives on on 100% renewables, uh, the European Green Deal, and and various other topics we're going to address. Um, so the first speaker that uh, I would like to to welcome uh, now is Michaela Hall. Uh, Michaela is policy officer at the European Commission. She uh, works in renewables and, and the CCS policy, um, so she's part of the Director General for Energy. And she has held various positions within DG Energy um, for, and since um, actually 2008, uh, if I'm not wrong. I think she joined the commission in, uh, in 2004 and worked um, as an parliamentary assistant for somebody who's quite well known here in Brussels, uh, who's Claude Terms, former MEP, uh, long lasting uh, fighter for the energy transition and now the energy minister of Luxembourg. So um, thank you, Michaela, for joining us and the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Can everyone hear me? Hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear you well. Yes, we okay, cool. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Thanks for your kind introduction and thanks for this event. It is really super timely. Um, today, our energy ministers, including our famous Claude Turmes, and it seems that even after having left his office, uh, like what, 15 years ago, I can still not escape his big shade, shadow, uh, but okay. Uh, so today, the, um, there's the informal energy council where the recovery plan uh, and spending will be discussed. Later this week, it's the the leaders or uh, the the governmental leaders, uh, so Merkel and Macron, who will be looking at it. Um, and I think things move super super fast um, in this arena. And uh, I think it is really really a very timely event because uh, it is about yeah, how should I say, defining a bit more what has been maybe at some, so let's say when our recovery plan and the revised MFF refer to the Green Deal as a priority, I think it's very important to define exactly what we mean by this, because I think it was Christian who already said, the Green Deal is basically a huge work program, but some of it isn't even adopted yet, let's say plastics, etc. So I think, uh, uh, in the debate that is ensuing now, we should make sure that we know exactly what we talk about when we say it has to be in line with the Green Deal. Uh, there's also, I wanted to say, I think it's in a communication on the recovery spending where we say uh, what we do now to relaunch the economy, should, there sh it should be following the principle of do no harm. And again, this is not really defined. Um, there were other institutions that have defined what that could mean, say the EIB, even they revised their lending criteria. So I, I guess the, the debate that is coming now will be very interesting. Um, I think what's very important to look into is, is the recovery plans, because I'm, uh, the whole package is very difficult to understand if you're not a finance geek. But I think the most important is the money, 560 billion, that were put into this, what is called the recovery and the resilience facility. So that is the additional new money that we, uh, based on the deal between Macron and Mer uh, Merkel, uh, have put on the table. Um, and this, first of all, because there's a lot of grants in it, but secondly, also because it's the member states themselves that decide where the money goes, and they do this through so-called recovery plans that will have to be prepared between now and at the latest April next year. And it is in those recovery plans where we will see how much money goes into say renewables. Uh, it could be used for example, to uh, make sure that we are not losing uh, the rhythm on uh, renewables auctioning schemes because uh, 
um, during COVID, some member states did indeed uh, announce that they will stop auctioning planning and this kind of thing. Um, I also like always your emphasis on uh, the, the further that basically for decarbonization, Europe, uh, decarbonizing Europe as a whole, what we need is coordination between member states. And I think that is very important. It is, for example, super important in one file that I'm currently involved in, where we will be tabling uh, a strategy later this year uh, on offshore energy. So the commission will be uh, putting on the table a communication on offshore energy. So it's not only wind, but even if it's the, the core. Uh, somewhere in the autumn. And here, for example, we see clearly that uh, the scale we need, which is basically 20 times more capacity in the offshore seas than we have now within the next 30 years. So it is a huge industrial endeavor to make this happen. And that's the best way it is also in order to be in line with, you know, um, invading as little as possible the maritime spaces that member states go together on this. We have not seen this so far because it's complex uh, and we need to set the framework so that the, these kind of investments can happen. But also um, I think it will be important that some part of the recovery spending might actually need to be put into a common box by the various member states who want to go together. This could take, for example, the form of um, like what was done under the Battery Alliance, where Germany is also part. So Germany, France, and a handful of other member states decide to put money together and form, a, f form an industrial corporation. Um, okay, and uh, now let me just quickly say a few words on what we do on, uh, on, on revising the 2030 ambition and the NECPs. NECPs, uh, you've all heard, Germany submitted it finally last week. So by now we are missing one more, Ireland, because we are not really expecting the UK to submit one. We are looking at them now. Uh, it was a bit difficult to assess if the biggest country is missing. So we're looking at them now and we're thinking about how would be the best way to proceed from here. Uh, with regard to 2030, what was announced is that we propose and we hold on to this timetable, even though the, COP, the next COP meeting was, uh, was postponed, we'll put on the table a revised um, ambition for 2030 that looks at 50 to 55 percent reduction by 2030 uh, in September this year, and it will be underpinned by a modeling exercise with, which we are undertaking at the moment and I'm stopping because I'm already beyond schedule. Just so you know, um, a lot of time pressure on this modeling exercise because uh, it was already always uh, demanding, but now actually it, we need to feed in what we think the COVID crisis um, has resulted in, in terms of, you know, effects on demand and uh, growth, etc. And this is not very straightforward to do. But uh, as I said, it will be tabled in September. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Michaela, for this uh, quick overview. Uh, thanks really hard. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand over to our next guest, uh, who, is, who has quite a central role in this respect of for achieving the climate neutrality. Um, Welcome, Jutta Guteland, uh, a Swedish MEP from the Social Democratic Group, the SD Group. She is member of the Environmental Committee in the Parliament, and she uh, is the co coordinator of the of the NV for the SN, SN, uh, sorry, the SD Group. She has previously negotiated uh, climate and energy files, such as the, the revision of the EU ETS and the Energy Efficiency Direct Directive. So she um, is not new to the topic, obviously. Um, and uh, I think I'll hand over the floor to, uh, because one thing I, I almost forgot, she, um, being central for the climate neutrality in this respect directly means she is the rapporteur on the file of the climate law. And so without further ado, uh, let me hand over to, to you too. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, thank you uh, for, for this uh, opportunity. The, the to meet and gather together with you and thank you for the excellent presentations uh, from 
uh, everyone before me here and uh, it was really interesting also to listen to the professors and uh, on on, uh, on the renewables um i'm uh, as uh, now <laughs> the rapporteur of the climate on the eu climate law and uh, took the opportunity this spring to um finish my draft report and uh, also present it to the committee to envy uh, in the european parliament um, but i will start by saying a few words on the time we live in and then go through my report a little bit because i think it's uh, it could add to this seminar of course um, if i start with the green deal i think we must all acknowledge that it is a historic change for Europe to go from the coal and steel union to a climate climate neutrality union and uh, the Green Deal is really an uh, ambitious uh, um, road ahead and I, I think it's much bigger than I expected. I was a member of the European Parliament the last legislation period and I must say that the European deal was a uh, not a surprise, but it was better than I was expected when this commission uh, launched it in the end of last year. With the crisis that we live in now and the COVID-19 and the necessary uh, necessity to, to restart Europe after the, this uh, uh, crisis, I believe that uh, it's important that we do it with the Green Deal in center of, of the uh, restart of the economy and that uh, we use the transition to climate, neutrality, to climate neutrality as an opportunity for Europe, not as a hinder through this, but actually as something very natural, both because we need to do something big to avoid uh, that we don't uh, support the Paris Agreement, uh, but also because uh, uh, the Green Deal is an opportunity to change Europe to something better, to better health, welfare, and also new jobs, better technolo technology, and for the economy that is also an opportunity. So I really believe we don't have a contradiction here. We should really put the Green Deal in center of, of relaunching uh, the economy and, and Europe after the health crisis. That being said, I think that the climate law is the flagship of this uh, Green Deal and, and the change. And I'm really proud to work with the climate uh, law. And we have uh, presented, or I presented a report in Envy in the 27th of May and now I also had the privilege to uh, to see all the amendments and we have more than thousand amendments and I think we should be happy about that because it shows the commitment and the uh, interest from the members of uh, the European Parliament to contribute um, regarding the climate law I think it's uh, it's uh, important to be ambitious so I propose that we have a higher target for 2030. I propose 65%. I think it's in line with what's been said here today, but I also think it's to, uh, to honor the Paris Agreement and avoid the crisis that the planet will see if we don't do as the scientists are telling us. I also propose that we should have an intermediate target for 2040. Uh, to make sure that we don't let 20 years go without a new, very important um, point for Europe to, to achieve. And I say that the Commission should uh, deliver the impact assist assessment. And uh, of course, it should be somewhere between 80 and 85 percent reduction. But I think it's important to leave the Commission to do the impact assessment on this one. But it's very good to have uh, to achieve something and not leave 20 years without this very strong intermediate target. I also propose that the member states should um, have binding targets. I don't think it's fair that uh, if some member states should be left behind for obvious reasons. It's not fair for our planet. It's not fair for 
the citizens who will suffer, uh, but it's also for uh, absolutely in between the member states. I don't think that member states who's not doing enough can expect that the member states who are delivering will actually help the member states who are uh, behind that they will get the, need, the help they need economically later on when the others are climate neutral. So I think it's a bit of um, self-interest from the countries who are uh, not um, well prepared at this moment but uh, need to be, that they, they should in self-interest uh, be willing to, to raise the ambition because they can get better help from the others if they do so. Uh, that being said, I also want to say two, two more words, I think, on the climate report. I know uh, I should uh, end my uh, contribution now, uh, but very quick. I think we also need to make sure that we are evaluating what Europe is doing. So I'm proposing that we should have an expert pa panel who will evaluate a little bit similar like we have in some member states. It should not create its own data. It should not do what the environmental agency is already doing, but it should evaluate that we are doing what we should to respect and honor the Paris Agreement and also to reach climate neutrality. I also propose that we should have a um, carbon budget. And since the time is limited, I cannot go into it, but I think uh, this is one of, of, of my um, babies in this proposal. I really think it's important that we, that we deliver it and I hope that the commission will listen to it because it will help us to achieve um, and have a fair balance between the sectors and the member states and make it more logical how we can work in the negotiations. So I really believe by having a more mathematical model to work upon uh, that would help us to deliver climate neutrality. My last word is that this summer will be busy. We will have lots of negotiations, shadow meetings. I see that Michael Bloss is here. Uh, we will meet, we will work with the others and uh, make sure that we deliver this summer and then vote in uh, September in NV, hopefully in plenary, uh, in the first session in October. And then I hope we will meet the other institutions before the end of this year and hopefully can conclude a climate law for EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jutta Guteland. Uh, you made the transition rather easy. Um, our next speaker is the said uh, Minister Bloss, and I'll make this really quick. He's also working on the climate law, uh, but as a shadow rapporteur for the Greens in the European Parliament, and I think I'll just leave it to that. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Michel. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at this very interesting event. And thanks for this study, because I think it's very, very timely. Um, and it gives very good guidance on, on what to do now. Um, and I also um, think that what you are presenting is what we need to do in order to make the Green Deal a success story, but it's it's really a lot. The, the um, full switch to renewable energies, the, the fuel switch in the transport sector, in the heating sector. So there's a lot of things that, that need to be done. And we are currently with the reconstruction fund, with the economic stimulus program from the European Union, at the moment where we can, with the right investments, go into this direction, into the right pathway to really make it possible. But I think therefore the reconstruction fund really needs to be planned very well. And we need to take into consideration also what you just presented. Um, Michaela Hall said that uh, lots of the um, things will be on the member state level. And I believe um, since as she said, we have today the, the um, Member States Energy Council, we have the um, Heads of States meeting also at the end of the week and probably more often. There is really the opportunity to lay the right direction and the, or the, the idea that we should not spend any money on fossil fuels is I think from the utmost importance. And when we see currently how the reconstruction fund is 
program, there is no clear conditionality, no clear guidance on um, that, that there should not be money spent on fossil fuels. I think that's very important we take this into consideration. Um, secondly, the, the title of the study is 100% Renewables. And I think it's really important that we go into this direction. Um, I'm from the green side, the um, shadow rapporteur on the climate law, but also on the, in, um, the, the industry strategy from the European Union. And here um, it is quite difficult to convince the stakeholders that we need more renewable energy industry in Europe. We need to really um, have a huge uh, um, increase of renewable energy production. Um, I propose 70 million solar rooftops in the next 10 years as a part of the reconstruction fund, because otherwise we will not be able to um, really have the successful energy transition and climate transition. However, in the reconstruction fund as such, um, Hydrogen is much more, uh, how do you say, important than renewables. They're only mentioned um, in, a, in a very brief paragraph. And also in the industry strategy, the renewables are not that important. Even when we look to the German um, economic stimulus program, we see that renewables are mentioned, but we have 9 billion euros for hydrogen and there is no special um, funding for renewables. So putting renewables first in our strategies, I, th I think one of the big messages that comes up from your report, but that needs to be more carefully also ob ob observed by um, the European institution. And, um, and thirdly, the climate law, uh, and I really congratulate you to Gütteland for, for the excellent draft, um, for the excellent work, also for the courage to say 65% is the amount of CO2 that we need to reduce um, by 2030. The, um, the commission was not so, let's say, courageous to even assess if um, the 65%, they only do an impact assessment from 50 to 55%. But I think that what it's really needed is a, a very fast conclusion of the climate law in order for it to be the central orientation point for the reconstruction fund so that we can streamline and target the investment um, towards this um, CO2 emission reduction goal. And that would give the businesses and industry the really needed guidance on where to invest and how investments should go now. Um, if we now think about lowering our ambition, then I think this will create a lot of um, um, chaos and uncertainty even in the business world. So I think that's also really important for the um, German presidency. The German presidency will take over from next month. Um, Germany will be the one who is governing and moderating all of these very important debates. Unfortunately, we see that the whole climate context is um, deprioritized. It's not anymore part of this uh, big um, headlines of, um, of the German presidency. But what we really would need to see from the German presidency is that they finalize the negotiations on the climate law so that we have a very early um, direction on where to go um, on climate and then also streamline the um, reconstruction fund um, towards the climate law and make sure no, foss uh, no money is spent on fossil fuels. Um, last point, um, hydrogen. Um, in the German hydrogen plan, but also in the versions of the European hydrogen plan, we see there is a lot of, um, um, well, pri or there is a natural gas as a bridging technology. And also we heard from your report that this must not be the case. So we also take this from the report. And I think it's important to make this more heard in Europe, in the European policy sphere. Thank you very much for this great report. Thank you very much, Michael. So thanks a lot to Jutta and, and Michael uh, from the parliamentary side. Um, so we had a lot of legislation right now, over a thousand amendments. I think that's going to be a very busy summer. But we also would like to hear, to hear from David Sabalin now, who is uh, the Climate and Circular Economy Officer at the European Environmental Bureau, so um, an NGO and think tank working on energy and climate issues. He is focusing on decarbonization of industry and the heating sector. 
So maybe you'll go to uh, address some of the questions that uh, we've already had in the, in the Q&A section later. Um, and I will think I'll leave it to that. So Davide, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours now. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for the invitation and thank you for a very interesting uh, report. Uh, it is very timely, as it is, has been said, and um, I have to say we are also working on a, such, uh, on a report like this together with other NGOs. It will be presented on the 30th of June. We analyzed uh, the, the existing uh, scenarios of the grid operator, the, uh, the 10 year network development plan, and we are trying to see from the NGOs, from the civil society point of view, how this can be made compatible with the Paris Agreement and therefore exiting coal by 2030 and oil and nuclear by 2040 and gas by 2035 and using only uh, natural based CO2 removal. And, um, um, and then stay tuned. So uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll come up with our own scenarios um, from the civil society point of view, as I said. And uh, I, Briefly, I'd like to, 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 to complement what's been said about the, the green recovery from our point of view. Um, again, I'd like to stress what's, uh, what's been said about uh, the conditionality and transparency. Um, uh, we think that there must be more conditionality also starting from, from the, the political narrative there from the Commission. And um, because, because it has to be uh, the base for actually making sure that the, the Green Deal will be the core of this uh, recovery, and uh, both at the international level and at the national plans. And we have to make sure that all member states take this at heart and, and really will deliver on investments because we're talking about investments after we, this first phase where we'll be talking about investments. Investments will have to, at, at their heart the, the, the Green Deal. And uh, I'd like to, to mention that in, in some cases, like in big infrastructures and in, in that industry, we are just one investment cycle away from 2050, and therefore from climate neutrality. So we cannot uh, allow ourselves to make the wrong move because there won't be any possibility then to change or see it differently investments or we will be left with very relevant um, uh, stranded assets. Um, also, it's a, it's a matter of transparency, who we're going to give the money to. Some member states already have opened the debate about is it, is it feasible to give money to companies that have uh, their, their um, headquarters in uh, fiscal paradises. Um, also, we think that we should be focusing more on uh, giving more some more detailed uh, suggestions when it comes to steering in, in, in the investments in green jobs and uh, as Michael Loss already said in uh, renewable energies as for instance in ecological resilience but also in biodiversity which is one key topic of the uh, European Green Deal and secondly economy um, and uh, last but not least again on the recovery much of the money is allocated to member states. There's a lot of flexibility, so member states will be allowed to steer the way, their own way to, to recovery, which is understandable and very, very um, adequate, but there's a sufficient provision regarding the, how this money comes with state aid and this conditionality. And we've seen so far member states done, didn't really um, perform very well when it comes to con green conditionalities on state aid. Uh, at least not at the level we are expecting as NGOs, and uh, and there's room for improvement there yeah? from from the Commission, from generally speaking, from the European institutions. And uh, let before we go to more technical issues that can be tackled in the question and answer uh, section, I'd like to also give some insights from 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 our point of view uh, to the coming trio presidency. So not only the German presidency, but also the following ones, even though the, the lion's share will be taken by, by the German presidency because it's, it's really happening in the moment where a lot of key decisions are, are being, are being uh, taken, uh, politically speaking, and also a lot of files are going to be discussed. Um, so there's not only energy in the fields, I mean, it's only also a lot of topics which are energy related. I'd like to mention here circular economy. It has 
touched the he'd been touched upon before. I mean, if we don't go for a more circular uh, economy, um, we will not have uh, a decrease of embedded emissions, as for instance, and decrease of uh, energy uh, intensive production uh, that we need in order to, we need to to de decarbonize our um, our um, energy productions, for instance. We have to focus on material and energy uh, uh, reduction, and therefore, circular economy is key. We need a product policy which is more ambitious. We have to have uh, an extension of illegal designs, as for instance, that goes into repairability, goes into uh, resource efficiency, and not only energy energy consumption. Uh, we have to have. Uh, um, I'm going to read here also because it's a lot of uh, of, uh, of things we, we we can suggest. Um, so we have to have a um, a resource use uh, overall target. When we when we switch off the light, when we use a, an efficient bulb, we know we are contributing to the, our overall energy uh, efficiency target at European level, which has to be, by the way, in line with uh, the requirement of the IPCC. So 55% is not enough; should be going 65% uh, the, when it comes to um, CO2 emissions, and uh, and we also have to raise the energy efficiency. And, and, and renewable energy targets, by the way. But when I was saying, when we switch off the light, we contribute to a European target. Why don't we contribute to a European target when we go buying uh, stuff which has no packaging? There should be a, a, a target on, on this, and there should be a, a target on resource use and consumption footprint, and, uh, and that should be something that has to, that should be taken into consideration very, very soon in order to make sure that the action plan on the circular economy becomes something really concrete at both at the European and national level. And uh, we have to develop an ambition zero pollution action plan. This is also mostly forgotten. We talk about the climate, we talk about uh, circular economy a little bit, uh, but uh, we don't talk about zero, zero pollution. Also, uh, the industrial strategy that's been presented by, this, uh, by, the, by, the, by the Commission largely neglect this uh, target of the European Green Deal and its impact on the biodiversity. And there's going to be uh, the revision of the, uh, uh, we have to set the ground for revision of the air quality directives, which is again linked to energy production and industrial transformation. And when it comes to industrial transformation, as I'm speaking industry, uh, we have to make clear that, that this industrial transformation, which require a, huge, a staggering amount of, of renewable energy, as you mentioned clearly in your plan, will have to go hand in hand with the revision of the industrial emissions directive because it won't be the case that we'll have a second chance to put some extra billions or a thousand billions into, into our industrial production sectors uh, to steer what we already done for the climate. So, Climate and environmental impacts have to go hand in hand. So there's one chance to change our production, and these will deliver some. It will be a driver, to some extent, for our competition, um, for being on on leading on competition worldwide, both in on innovation and market uh, market share. And uh, last but not least, I'd say that we have to use this uh, this uh, upcoming year. Uh, to change the way we set our trade policy agenda. Uh, the rules we fix at European level must slowly but steadily become world rules in order to, to have a, 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 um, a level playing field for, which is uh, favorable also for our uh, companies, especially those who invest most in, in sustainability and resilience, which is a, a key word in these, in these, in these years. And, uh, and therefore, we need a, a rigorous border adjustment uh, agreement, but also an international uh, tendering procedures so that, uh, for instance, clean steel, low carbon steel, low carbon cement, low carbon productions can stand a chance in international uh, projects and therefore favor our uh, European, uh, uh, European economy. I'll stop here for the sake of time and uh, leave all the technical questions related to energy industry and energy and um, climate emissions and industry, if any, for the question and answer session. Thank you. So thank you very much, Davide. I'll quickly hand over to our last speaker for today.
who is uh, Bruce Douglas, and he's, di he's currently Director of Communication and Business at Euroelectric, which is a member-led association based in Brussels, representing the European electricity sector. Uh, Bruce has been working in renewables for over 20 years. Uh, he's currently working at Solar Power Europe, and I think I'll just hand over the floor to you now, Bruce. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Martin, and thanks for the invitation to join this webinar. Uh, so I'll, I'll start and, and finish with uh, one word, one priority word, which uh, is electrification uh, on, the, on the road towards decarbonization and 100% uh, renewables. The, the electrification of transport, heating and, and cooling is, is crucial, as many of the participants have mentioned, uh, to accelerate decarbonization. Um, electrification is uh, more energy efficient than other means of energy. And um, I mean, one example, of course, is EVs, but also heat pumps. Um, it can also lead to more res capacity being brought online um, and more resilience for the energy sector. Um, just a word on, on COVID and uh, the impact of COVID on the, the power sector. Uh, of course, there was re reduced demand for the last few months for electricity across uh, European member states, leading to record low prices. Um, it also led to increased mix of renewables in the grid, which is uh, a great thing. I mean, over 40% of renewables uh, across Europe in the, in the power mix. Um, and the reduction of coal uh, in the UK, my, my old country, I'm now Belgian, but uh, I came from the UK, from a coal mining area in the UK. And uh, for the last two months, there's been no coal in the power mix in the UK. Uh, that's the first time that's happened in, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, some 150 years ago or so. Um, there's also a very positive element, which is um, no blackouts. Um, the resilience of the power sector was very strong. Uh, and I suppose the two conclusions across all that is that renewables are not just cost competitive. Uh, the cost reductions of renewables over the last few years have brought costs down to the point where they are the cheapest form of new power uh, across Europe. Um, but they're also very resilient, and that's, a, that's an important point to take away. In terms of the 100% renewables going forward, I mean, obviously, having been a lobbyist in renewable energy for the last 20 years, I mean, I find that prospect very interesting. Um, and uh, our study at Euroelectric showed that, you know, up to 90% of renewables by 2050 uh, is possible. So renewables are really the only game in town. The majority of investments last year in Europe were in renewables, and we anticipate that to, to only strengthen going forward. Um, and our sector, the utility sector, we see it as uh, leading the charge in terms of uh, decarbonization. The EU power sector um, it's not only the biggest owners and operators of uh, renewables, so utilities own and operate uh, significant amounts of renewables across Europe. They're also the largest investors in uh, new renewable capacity. Uh, so offshore wind has been mentioned, large scale uh, solar PV. Um, also important to mention um, new demand coming from corporates. So corporate uh, off takers interest in, in power purchase agreements. So directly purchasing renewable energy. Um, and I'll, I'll end with um, maybe the conclusions and the, the, the challenges we face uh, in terms of this sector. Um, if we are going to electrify and we estimate something like a doubling of demand for uh, electricity uh, out to 2050, um, we need um, significant uh, new amounts of renewables. We talked about uh, offshore wind, something like over 400 gigawatts of offshore wind, something like 900 gigawatts of solar across Europe. I mean, you can argue the numbers, but there are, there are large figures. Um, and there we'll need uh, help with permitting and public acceptance to, uh, to put in those renewable capacities. Um, we also need support with uh, grid infrastructure, new grid infrastructure, storage and flexibility. Um, and then on the electrification, the direct electrification um, support, and as you see now in the recovery plan, support going to electric vehicles and charging infrastructure, which needs significant ramping up, and clear commitments for direct electrification. And finally, um, in order to uh, incentivize electrification and also provide an equitable transition uh, to avoid energy poverty, we really need the removal of unnecessary taxes and levies uh, on electricity. So I'll end there. Again, the priority word for us is electrification. It can lead to uh, accelerated decarbonization and help with uh, pushing the, the renewable capacities. 
So thanks a lot. Thanks again, Martin, for the invite. Um, I look forward to working with uh, Jutta, Michael, Michaela, and others uh, during the busy summit period. And uh, thanks again. Thank you very much, Bruce, and thanks for highlighting the importance of electrification. Um, I think we are running a little bit out of time, which uh, leads me to the fact that I will directly uh, continue with the first question that has been asked in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and I would like to address this question, uh, who, uh, the question which came from Astrid Geiger, who is representing um, the executive agency for, EOC, for, sorry, for, for um, small and medium enterprises. Uh, I'd like to address that question to um, Claudia, Christian, and Paul Yu. So the question is, in your study, do you already take into account post-corona scenarios in terms of economic development, radical societal change, environment, or the simulations based on old thinking? In fact, I think this is what we need now, take the opportunity now to go for societal, societal radical transformation. So maybe Claudia, you would be would like to be the first on ask you uh, sorry on, on addressing this question uh christian or paul you would that would you like uh, to uh, paul you because that's that's the open entrance scenario which is mm -hmm. looking yeah. into the future yeah. well of course um the difficulty with science is always that we try to be as thorough as possible so we work years and years in our methodology then we adjust final data and then we press f9 literally and try to look at the results and then suddenly like COVID comes and everything changes. And of course, none of us saw COVID coming, nor did the politicians. So um, the short answer is <coughs> that the results do not reflect COVID yet. However, this is, I think, not the most important thing because um, we are showing long-term trends until 2040, 2050. So this is something the challenge has not changed from that. Um, we have seen that demand has even grown down, as also some of the previous speakers have mentioned, so some things might even be easier. We've seen in the COVID times that our society is able to change if they perceive a crisis mm -hmm. coming. So I think this is uh, some important lessons learned. So um, our numbers do not reflect yet the COVID change. However, I think with respect to long-term elements, the challenges upcoming 2025, 2030, 2040, um, this will not re change our answers that we had. So therefore, I think it's still even more valid, it's even more needed. And our main um, findings basically stating that, especially in times of COVID, because we mentioned these aspects in the paper as well, but our modeling is not based on this, um, it is even more important that the recovery funds that will come in of post-COVID times will not go into these fossil fuel sectors. It's important that governments now do not stop climate policies because they feel they don't have the money for doing so, but it is even more important that they concentrate on sustainable solutions to go forward in the post-COVID recovery. Yeah, I would like to add also one sentence because uh, we did um, we did a study for the German economy on the recovery program uh, on, on three different uh, studies. And it's exactly as Paul, you said, that everything depends on the fact uh, where the recovery money, the financial aid is going to. And if you spend it for insulation, for energy efficiency in buildings, it's very much economy stimulating. And um, if you spend it for fossil fuel or technologies, it's exactly not the way we want to go forward to reach the Green Deal. So we strongly recommend uh, to take action out of this, um, this crisis in order to invest into renewables, energy saving, and also the, the transformation of the transport system, which is as important. Okay, let me uh, just, because for, for the sake of time, um, just point, let me just point out that uh, the DEV Berlin team has been quite active uh, in the question and answer session uh, already. And so uh, a lot of questions actually have been answered by written, by written uh, answers. So thank you very much for that. And actually I'd like to um, give now the, the final word to, to Claudia, Christian and, and Paul Yu to maybe um, leave us with some final remarks. And um, thanks a lot for being that clear with the presentation. I think I'll send a link in the, in the chat. I will also send it again so that everybody, everybody can access, this, access it right now. And uh, now some final remarks, remarks from the EV. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martin. I would like to, to add only a few sentences when I give over to, to Christian. Let me just thank you all uh, for providing the opportunity to present the study and, and showing that the Green Deal is a huge challenge, 
um, but we can make it uh, uh, if, we, if we do it well. And this is a, a simulation we did on the European level. I'm extremely thankful to the DIW team. Um, they, they did a great job in order to present also and, and finalize the report by this morning and also showing the, the slides here. Thanks, Sibyl uh, Stiftung. Thanks, Martin, Eva, and all the others uh, for providing our, us the floor to, to present this. Thanks also to the, to the panelists. I think there were great comments and great remarks we take into account and uh, go for, for a deeper uh, discussion in the next future. Uh, we have a, a big challenge in front of us, but uh, we are very optimistic that we can make it if, if we invest into the right direction with this. Just uh, thanks a lot. And I would like to hand over to, to Christian. Well, just uh, briefly, uh, I include, of course, all, all the thanks. Uh, in particular, also for the good cooperation with the PAC scenario team. Uh, Davide mentioned this important study that actually will take 100% scenarios for the first time into the operation, TYNDP, electricity, but also natural gas. What does it mean if natural gas disappears? Well, what are we going to do? And in general, I would say that the session has highlighted, in particular, thanks to the uh, discussions, uh, the need to as I say, uh, start to work, continue to work uh, on the European Green Deal at the operational level, which means uh, the climate law, <clears throat> the impact assessment needs to work on 60 and 65 percent reduction scenarios. Industrial emission directive needs to work on decarbonization at the operational level in transportation we need to work on electrification, but also on railways. Um, so I think this is one element and we are very happy to work with whoever is interested uh, to continue this important thing because we see the glass half full of the European deal as a bridge between sustainable and economic recovery. Thank you very much. And maybe some last statements from my side. This was a lot of information. There was a lot of slides, a lot of data. Maybe your screen is very small, so it was difficult for you to see everything. So the study is online. Feel free to post questions to us. Send us an email if you have detailed questions, and we will try to respond to you as fast as possible. And also one other question was, in how far is this, should this be interpreted also? And um, let me just highlight the need of researchers. We are putting out their analysis, and we are not deciding things. This is for elected politicians to take the decisions upon, but we can provide some information on this. This study that we are showing is showing a Paris compatible scenario that has a full decarbonization by 2040. This is not a forecast. We're not saying that 2040 will look like this. We say this is how it should look like this, and we're showing one pathway of aiming forward, which would be cost efficient. Also, the thing is that we have seen that policies have been more proactive. So what we see in the past is that you shouldn't wait for a crisis to appear, but you should act proactively now. And this is why it's very important. You should engage with the people. And I think one of the things to be learned is that we see in the past that actually those regions, those communities, those industry branches that move first, they are the ones that will basically come out strongest afterwards. So therefore it will be the communities that basically go forward and they say, we know it's gonna be difficult for us as a carbon intensive region, as carbon intensive industry, but we are looking for new possibilities. We engage with political decision makers. We will probably get more funding than from the Just Transition Fund. And then we will probably come out stronger in the end. So this is, I think the positive narrative, we have to engage with one another and look forward. And we as researchers are very happy that we can maybe contribute a tiny piece to this. And we look forward to future cooperations with all the 100 people, people in the chat and even more. Thank you very much. And back to Heinrich Böll von this. Thank you very much, Claudia, Christian, and Paul Yu. Thank you very much for this excellent study. Um, we are looking forward to, to further cooperation, of course, and on this level, we would like to, of course, uh, work in further projects with, with you. It was, it's been a pleasure for, for me today to moderate this event. I'd like to thank all the discussants that have joined us in the second session, um, bring up the very valuable perspectives and of course a big thank you for all the participants that have joined us uh, from their homes or even maybe offices uh, again right now. Uh, thank you for your